one of the reasons that what's happening in Japan is very interesting is that they innovate in terms of um, legislating different categories of personal data. One key misunderstanding about the GDPR um, is that it creates a regime where data should not leave um, Europe. Right now, we are indeed facing this huge challenge and problem of um, 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 islands of data, um, data localization, and uh, fragmented internet. Hello everyone, I am Sergio Maldonado and this is Masters of Privacy, a set of interviews covering the intersection of marketing, data, privacy and technology with a clear goal in mind which is redefining the relationship between people, brands and publishers around transparency and control. Which is to say, we're aiming for real customer centricity or if you will, human centricity. It may take us five years, ten years or more, but we're patient. We're enjoying the ride, pushing our ideas farther with every single one of our guests. Speaking of which, let's get on with the show. Okay, we're welcoming Gabriela Zamfir Fortuna. She's a senior counsel for global privacy and EU data protection law at the Future of Privacy Forum and former legal officer for the EDPS in Brussels, that's the European Data Protection Supervisor. She's a PhD in data protection law, and we're going to get started trying to understand what's happening to data protection and privacy around the globe. Gabriela, thanks for joining us. Absolutely, my pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. It'd be good to get started with um, the EU and the, what you think about the framework and how the EU is addressing these recent challenges, not just on AI, but everything else. And from there, I'd love to go into comparative law, applying to, to privacy and data protection. So maybe as a quick summary, what do you think of the EU framework as it is taking shape these days? We are seeing a lot of um, action uh, in uh, uh, the European Union in Brussels in terms of legislative proposals that come out of the data strategy and the digital strategy that the European Commission announced um, recently. And I think it marks a very, very interesting um, next level of regulation uh, in the sense that um, once the European Union made up its mind about how to uh, treat personal data. And now we have uh, this comprehensive framework in place, the GDPR, um, which culminated an evolution uh, of regulation that started uh, sometime in the 70s at national level with data protection law. We have it in place. Um, I see that now the European Union goes to the next level and uh, starts thinking about how to share uh, personal data. How can we, on the one hand, facilitate data sharing? Um, on another hand, um, have you know, some rules in place um, around it, but with the end goal of actually creating a, a digital um, European Union and uh, harnessing all the power of all this data. So uh, I think this is quite fascinating to um, observe from a regulatory point of view. Um, and um, this is why the European Union is seen as the lead regulator in the, in the digital space uh, in the world. It, it just it never stops, as you can see. Um, yes, yes. I, I'm counting in this uh, next level of regulation, uh, the Digital Services Act, um, the um, Digital Markets Act, the Data Governance Act, the AI regulation, the draft proposal that was just announced uh, very recently, uh, last week compared to the moment when we're recording this. And um, keep in mind that we will see a data act later this year, which uh, apparently it's aimed at facilitating data sharing between businesses and governments, like the B2G data sharing. Um, so that's going to be very interesting. 
And um, I think the European Union is leveraging the fact that we settled on how to protect personal data. We have all of the basic rules in place. Now let's look at how we can harness all of that. Do you think that's sort of the consequence of a bad experience? in all of the issues we've had with data transfers or do you think so maybe as a result of experience now we find a way to make it more practical or do you think it's instead the result of some sort of eagerness to compete in the one space where we can compete given that you know if i can be cynical uh the us and and china that are much more advanced in AI, for example? I think there is a bit of that indeed. Um, I think uh, that the European Union is um, unchallenged in terms of uh, the top regulator of um, everything digital. And um, this is showing leadership in, in, in that particular area. Um, let's see, you know, one of the components of the AI regulation is uh, the draft proposal of the AI regulation is to facilitate innovation. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of opinions saying that whatever is proposed in that chapter will not going to be enough um, because the core proposal is a regulatory sandbox that would allow experimenting with developing AI systems under the supervision of a regulator. And uh, many voices um, uh, here in the US when, where I'm based now are saying that, well, I'm not sure that providing a regulatory sandbox is going to push innovation uh, in AI, but totally. nice try. Now, um, we, we don't know. Let's see um, what will happen. And let's see if in the legislative process, there are going to be other additions made by the other um, institutions that have a voice here, the European Parliament, the Council, uh, in terms of expanding those provisions for innovation. Yeah, okay, interesting. So let's take it elsewhere. Let's go all over the place, since you have been all over the place analyzing uh, data protection and privacy laws. Japan, I have to start there because it called my attention. Something that you wrote, I think, on Twitter about how they treat cookies, and because I am so obsessed with cookies, I read that now they find they found a new category. So where you've got pseudonymous data or pseudonymized data, which is where many would say cookies fit today. In Japan, they differentiate pseudonymized data and a new sort of novel category. I can't remember the name, but maybe there's more to it. And maybe there's a few things you want to throw in there or compare with any other novel systems and changes that you've seen all over the world. Indeed, um, recently I've been paying a lot of attention um, on how data protection and privacy legislation are proliferating around the world. And uh, one of the jurisdictions that um, is very interesting to follow is Japan. Um, recently, um, we've hosted uh, a thought leadership post uh, written um, by Take Sujimoto and his team. And I was very happy to um, include it in, in a series that I am editing and coordinating for the FPF blog on uh, global privacy. I've worked um, closely with uh, Take and his team to make sure we bring the, the best uh, of the changes in the Japanese law. And one of the reasons that what's happening in Japan is very interesting is that they innovate in terms of um, legislating different categories of personal data and identifying different categories of data generally that is covered by the APPI, uh, which is uh, the uh, Personal uh, Privacy and uh, Data Protection Act of Japan. Um, and indeed, they are identifying several categories um, of data that falls under uh, the rules of the APPI. Um, one of them is um, data that, um, that's uh, created by uh, cookies. And um, that's quite interesting to see, to see that type of data differentiated from pseudonymous, pseudonymized, data from personal data 
but still falling under rules of the regulation there. So it's a very interesting space to follow uh, from this point of view also. Yes, yes. And what about China? Is there anything that you would uh, sort of stress out of the recent developments that we should at least understand? There are uh, several developments around the world that um, are absolutely relevant and that should be followed by um, practic practitioners, but also by scholars, I would say. And one of those developments is definitely the um, general comprehensive data protection law that's being proposed by China, the PIPL. Um, one other very, very relevant um, phenomenon to follow is the data protection bill of India. And there are many reasons for that. I will start with the one that's my favorite. These two laws um, are going to give data subject rights, as we know them in Europe, to about 2.7 billion persons. Just think about that. If you put together you know, the population of India and the population of China, uh, it's really outstanding to see um, rights and safeguards um, in relation to how personal data is collected, used, uh, given to so many people. It's, it's really uh, very difficult to comprehend. Uh, so that's one reason. Another reason is that um, both laws also innovate, but innovate in terms of um, regulating um, personal data. And while they take inspiration from the GDPR, and this is really obvious when you, when you read uh, the two draft proposals, it immediately becomes obvious that um, they also innovate and they um, you know, come up with um, neat novel concepts, um, concepts that have not been tested a lot. So I will give you an example with the India bill. There's something, um, a consent management uh, tool is being proposed as an automated uh, centralized way to manage consent uh, whenever it is given uh, in, in specific situations under this bill. Um, I hope so, it's not like the ones we are using for cookies. I hope they it, can escape that. There you go. So it's very interesting to follow what's happening um, uh, just so we know if it's going to be the same thing with the consent management tools we're seeing now privately, uh, how is it going to function um, and, and uh, what's happening there. Um, and so once you start looking on the global scene, um, there are a lot of things that start popping up. One of them, for example, in Russia uh, is that um, I've seen in uh, the most up, uh, recent update of the Russian data protection law, uh, a consent management tool also popping. Um, they are proposing a consent management tool um, administered by the Russian um, information commissioner, the Roskomnadzor, uh, to um, manage consent for um, publicly available personal data. So they're, nas they're nationalizing the what in the US is a huge business or in Europe, like Trust Stark, One Trust, all these players, they are nationalizing that. Uh, yes, so indeed. So you, you are seeing this consent management um, tool um, appearing uh, at, uh, in legislation. The one I mentioned in Russia, it's already uh, implemented, it entered into force. Now, I think they're just, um, they're in a period of time where they are finalizing um, application um, methodology and so on. Uh, in India, um, it's part of the legislation that is currently being discussed um, in, in the parliament. So it's still being debated, um, but very interesting to follow. Now, one other point while all of these laws are interesting uh, for me is that you can see the um, different type and different nature and different culture in, in a society, how they, inf uh, they influence the type of data protection rules that are being proposed and the different uh, type of government as well. Um, so you can look at um, you know, how China regulates and is trying to regulate personal data, what type of focus appears there. Um, 
And uh, uh, you can look at how India is doing this from its position of, of a common law type of um, parliamentary democracy. Um, so that's also very, very interesting to follow. Have you assessed this from the point of view of data transfers? Because in the end, we do have a global economy and even US companies recently, Clubhouse, right? You said they had some systems in Shanghai. Uh, how do we then make them work together? I understand Russia may be a bit more isolated with a few of the things that I've seen, but China seems to be pretty well ingrained and India as well with the US and, and Europe and all of these you know, digital services. Have you thought of that? It's definitely one of the um, key things I'm looking at um, in, uh, in this developing um, legal regimes on data protection. And um, all of these new laws have some strong components of, of data localization, first of all. Second of all, um, all of them have some rule in place, rules in place for transfers, uh, indeed. And um, this is one essential thing to follow. How will data flows be affected? Um, and I do not know. I do not have the answer uh, for that. It's also very difficult um, to talk about this before we are seeing the actual laws being uh, adopted. Uh, both of the processes in India and China are ongoing. Uh, the one in China is very, very much advanced. Actually, um, these days, uh, as we are recording this, um, a second version of the draft law is being discussed and adopted um, by the relevant structure <laughs> in the Chinese legislative, uh, which I would not dare to name because I'm, I, I do not know the name. Um, and there is serious expectation that this law will pass by the end of the year. So let's see what happens there. I would say that compared to the existing regime, which is uh, very much focused on data localization, this new law has some provisions in place that would allow data transfers uh, even out of China. But um, of course, you know, the government will have a big role in uh, sort of deciding uh, the jurisdictions where uh, data will, will be um, able to be transferred. So, or... so Gabriela, there's like two forces at play. And I think this will be my last question for you. Because um, on the one hand, it is happening that the GDPR may be acting as a blueprint and by doing so, there seems to be, you know, some common ground. And at the same time, it also does feel like we're building this internet of, of these many, the world of many internets, as many people are saying, where, as you said, data localization, right? Russia is asking for servers to be there, data to be there, uh, you know, just as the EU now is struggling to even agree with the US, which is supposed to be an easy partner after, you know, Schrems too we have also a huge pump on the road. So if we struggle there, what do you think? I mean, I guess we're all very positive about the future, but what's your first impression? You've identified it. This is the problem. This is why um, I, I have been looking so closely at all of these other systems, because I believe this is something we should avoid. Um, one, key misunderstanding about the GDPR um, is that it creates a regime where data should not leave um, Europe. And um, a lot of people that have been studying the GDPR and the previous directive um, in, in the years past would say that the chapter in international data transfers, it is actually meant to facilitate transfers, but just that data are protected while they are being transferred. It is not meant to stop transfers and create uh, like, uh, you know, a Europe uh, high tower where data is kept. Um, unfortunately, this vision is not very well 
promoted right now, but I, I believe that this is the case. And who knows where the um, jurisprudence of the Court of Justice will, will go um, in the future. Uh, I hope this will be seen by more people that that particular chapter is meant to facilitate transfers, not block transfers. Um, that being said, right now, we are indeed facing this huge challenge and problem of um, 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 islands of data um, data localization and uh, fragmented internet. Uh, I hope that this will not be the case, but we need a lot of people to focus their attention on what's happening around the world and on uh, sending the message that the systems need, need to be open. As long as the data is protected, there are safeguards in place, it should be safe for the data to move around and uh, just uh, let um, cross-border data um, fulfill its potential. Anything else we should be paying attention to as our homework? Uh, I don't know, Kenya, I believe, is it Kenya that has a adequate, an adequate level of protection? I don't know which one it is. Um, not yet, uh, not, not okay. yet, but Kenya does have a new uh, data protection law that entered into force in January. And I would say that uh, some of the most interesting things uh, are happening in Africa. There are uh, some jurisdictions that I'm following. Uh, Nigeria is one of them, uh, where um, a data protection law is being discussed uh, right now. Um, South Africa is another one, where the data protection law that has been adopted already many years ago will finally entirely enter into force this July. So that's going to be interesting to follow. And uh, just um, a lot of data protection authorities appearing also in Africa, which will enrich the um, data protection regulators uh, community around the world. So that's interesting. And Brazil, let's not forget about Brazil. Uh, Brazil is, is the most flamboyant uh, jurisdiction right now in terms of data protection. They have this detailed uh, law, um, the LGPD, and a new regulator, which is very active. Um, I'm, I'm seeing that uh, they are really passionate about uh, their mission and uh, a very, very big uh, community of data protection enthusiasts and specialist professionals that is being built right now uh, in Brazil. Good, thank you. Anything on the Future of Privacy Forum's website that you think is, I'm sure you'd say everything is worth reading, but anything particularly interesting for maybe those in ad tech or marketing technology or e-privacy that you think we should be paying attention to? Um, I would say that indeed um, all of it is interesting. Uh, check out uh, a, a training course that my colleagues uh, are um, organizing these days. And there's actually a particular training on uh, the data flows required for ad tech. Uh, cool. which uh, has been, yeah, very, very, it has raised a lot of interest and has been quite successful. Thank you. We'll link to that one. Gabriela, thanks a lot. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Sergio. It was a pleasure. Okay, that's all for today. Please find episode notes and links to our social channels and other feeds on mastersofprivacy.com. Please do not give us five stars on your favorite podcasting channel unless you believe there is no more room for improvement. Your candid feedback is probably more useful to us. Thank you.